In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious Lord, we thank you for all that we have been able to reflect upon in the name of living the covenant love that you have made us to share with you, particularly in looking more deeply at each of the sacraments and in more recent times looking at those things that aid us in partaking in the sacraments. And now tonight as we enter into a very important and yet at times very polarized topic of music for worship, help us, we pray, to stay focused on your love, your truth, your will, that indeed through our time together, we might be drawn into greater awareness above all of your true desire for us, which is eternal life in your presence. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Saint Cecilia, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So here we are back for session 13. I think the term they use is penultimate session. You know, the last before the last. And um, just to get right into it, because there's a lot to cover tonight, and I don't want to leave things behind, minding that I had to make choices to leave things out tonight. Um, up to this point, we have looked at each of the seven sacraments from the perspective of what it means to partake of them as an exchange of covenant love, that is, as an actual participation in the divine life of God that he himself wills for us to share through the new covenant established in Jesus Christ, both in this life through our reception of the sacraments and what he has offered us, but also through our humble response to him in love, through worshiping him, through bowing down to him, given to him as a right return, given to him who accomplishes everything on our behalf and truly desires to draw us perfectly into himself. And so that was the basically the first 11 sessions and well, really 10, but 11 and 12 kind of switched over to looking more at the sacred things, including the church buildings themselves that are meant to aid us toward a most fit disposition to partake of the sacraments as this covenant exchange of love. And, you know, we learned how the visible, tangible things that we have available to us in the life of the church through the church's own giving them of the uh, giving these things to us such as the devotional items sacred art and yes the architecture of the church buildings not to mention the furnishings of the churches themselves all of these things can help draw us into a more complete encounter with god and to share in that divine life accordingly partaking in his life and in his true beauty god being perfect beauty and how, you know, those things that are objectively declared to be beautiful, meaning that they show us something of the beauty of God, the beauty of heaven, all of these things draw us more closer to him, or at least facilitate us being drawn more closer. Now this evening, we want to focus on one last element of true worship of God as a fit and right response to him in this covenant love that he initiates that we are called to live. And this particular element, it's not simply an add-on to the worship or something that's only meant as an aid for our worship. Honestly, it's inherent to the worship and it's meant to lead us to offer ourselves to the Lord even more perfectly, even more humbly, elevating in a sense, our response to God beyond, you know, what it might otherwise be. And we want to be mindful that as we speak tonight of this reality, which of course is the 
the singing and the music that is meant to be employed in worship. And we're talking about a true gift from God that is meant to be offered in return, just like every other gift that he gives us. If we go way back to when we learned about what is the nature of true worship, it is to offer ourselves, to bow down to him, to give our whole self to him. And that, of course, includes the fact that he has given us this capacity for music and for singing. <clears throat> and so that is meant to be of that offering in return. Um, and again, this truly elevates and adds greater beauty to the offering that we make in return. But again, before we get fully into this, I want to do a couple of things. One is I want to review some of the observations that were presented last week about our particular time in the history of the church and some of the tensions that exist, if only to reiterate the right acknowledgement of the sincere lived faith of so many in the church in our times, even if there's different ways and divergent ways at that, that this lived faith is at times expressed, where, yes, music is certainly one of these areas where very often some of this divergence is to be found. And so we want to, to look at that. And also I want to do a little bit more of kind of music in general to start before we get into the more churchy part. But as for this reiterating of last week, it's important to recall that yes, there are real sad divisions in the church at the present time. And these divisions can be linked to shifts in kind of philosophical perspective, but also theological emphasis that has come to pass over recent centuries, both in and out of the church, but especially have been manifested in the last 75 years or so within the church, moving the church in a very definite way toward a greater emphasis on the centrality of our own human initiative and you know, action in approaching God accordingly, while at times reducing God's primacy, which is something, of course, that I've been seeking to emphasize through and through in basically every previous session up to this point, that God is always the initiator. God is the one who offers everything we are, everything we have, and accordingly. And so we want to acknowledge that, yes, there has been a shift away from remembering and recalling that primacy of God to a sense of, yes, the human initiative. Um, and these changes and emphases have concretely then resulted in varied interpretations of the Catholic faith, so much so that today we can't simply say, I'm Catholic, and that's clear and no further questions need to be asked, but we have all of these labels such as conservative or liberal or progressive or traditional and the like, such that, you know, again, we, we have division and it's a division that is truly not intended to be there. Um, and subsequently within these labels and divisions, you know, and this emphasis of, you know, man's action versus God's action, you know, the accompanying lived practices that we, we have are too frequently the source of many of the temp tensions and, you know, specifically within worship and in other re areas related to worship does this show itself for us. And so it's necessary that we realize that because we, yes, are a divided church, that there are many people who are sincerely and truly trying to do the right thing, who want to devote themselves fully and completely to a life, a ministry in the church with that utmost sincerity, that utmost desire to live what is true, and yes, to live the Catholic faith. And given this sincerity that so many have, well, you know, at the same time, acknowledging that these tensions are not to be simply acknowledged and glossed over. You know, it's a high task that a session like this has and why, 
and why I said at the Mass, you know, that it struck me the whole truth of doing and living the will of God. This is, this is the end goal. This is what we want to seek, is God's will, which I believe is the unarguable goal that can cut through every one of these divisions, every one of these tensions, is are we seeking to live as God wills us to live? And accordingly, that can help us on this path um, through you know, what is perhaps some tough sledding that we're gonna be going through. Um, and we want to look accordingly at what the church, officially so, has handed down to us at its face value, minding that, again, it's not any intention this night, or for that matter, on any of these nights, to vilify or blame for any divisions that exist presently in the church, but there's a hope that we can, by reading things at the face value, see the high road and take that high road and acknowledge that, yes, again, we are called to live in God, to share perfect union and communion with him, both in this life and particularly in eternal life, to realize that, that he who is within his very nature as a trinity, he who is relationship and communion, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that he has willed us just for that, to be able to share in his divine life, to be able to share in that perfect union and communion, not just now, but forever. And for us to be able to partake of that calls us to rightly open ourselves to accepting it and then to offer ourselves in return in accord with the new eternal covenant in Christ. And so it's important that we look at the church's faith and teaching, yes, at its face value, as I've mentioned, minding all of these end goals, that God is the, the giver of life. And so I want to repeat that my intention is to do just that, to go about this evening, to offer things at their face value, minding that some of what I present may not be easily accepted. And it's not my intention to hurt anyone or blame anyone for any of the info that is brought forth tonight, but rather to help us all recognize again where we are truly called to go and how the church is truly an instrument of God leading us to and drawing us quite honestly to himself through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And so we want to keep these things in mind, especially minding again these emphases that I bring up the emphasis on the primacy of God versus this emphasis on the primacy of our human action and initiative, you know, and to try to work our way through that to see the highest good here. So that being kind of the broader pretext and in a certain sense, a little bit of a explanation of how I want to go about this, you know, before we look at the music for worship specifically, I want to do this second thing, and that's acknowledge music as music, in a sense. And, you know, with the disclaimer that, you know, I, for my part, am wanting to go about this with a sense of just appealing to my own experience and not as a professional musician, which I am not, even though certainly what I present to you tonight is something that, yes, I have received further education in and thus do have right competency to be able to share these things. And it's not just a parish priest, per se, who's giving his perspective on sacred music, but it is one who has, as part of broader studies, actually studied these subjects, and particularly some of the, the source material from the 20th century that we'll be going through tonight to help us get an understanding of where we are. So let's make a few observations about the nature of music in relation to our human nature, more generally. You know, first of all, I think it's true that we can acknowledge that music has power on multiple levels. It has the power to form us. It can move our emotions. It gives expression and even purpose 
to our values, our way of life. And so to kind of look at each of these individually, that music has power to form us, I think is easy for each of us to recall from our own experience that, you know, it can aid us in being taught even most, the most basic truths, you know, or for that matter, even things that are more complex. Music has that power to mold us through communicating through song that which is heard, that which is spoken in the music. And in order to illustrate this, I've chosen two fun examples, two children's examples for that matter just to make it even more abundantly clear about the power of music to form us. One of them is the favorite from pre-K or kindergarten, if you're old enough to not have pre-K, or perhaps first grade, if you didn't have kindergarten even. And that's the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. right? That teaches our children the alphabet, and it is likely very effective. The other example, perhaps a little bit more obscure, but I'd say a pretty commonly known one still, and this one, you know, is, comes to us from Sesame Street, and for YouTube's sake, no, I do not own the rights to any of these things that I'm going to be singing tonight, but from Sesame Street fame, there's the cartoon pinball machine motif, and the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? Which kid after hearing that a few days isn't going to be able to count to 12? <laughs> Music has that power, and it's a great grace from our Lord, and it has the power to move our emotions. Even though I didn't really get into it, I could have, you know, kind of one, two, three, four, five, you know, kind of thing, right? It has these powers in it, um, you know, and with regards to the emotion, you know, I, I risk to say the sky is the limit here. Music can make us happy. Music can move us to tears. Tears of sorrow, tears of joy, tears of gratitude. It can give us chills. You know, I think of, you know, there's particular music that, you know, thanks to YouTube, you can find just about every, anything nowadays. But, you know, I, what comes to mind for me as one that gives chills as a sports junkie and having played basketball in my youth, there was a particular tune that one of the networks who broadcast professional football back in the 80s used to use as the intro music to their uh, pregame show. And it just happened that one of the local high schools, actually not too far from here, but they played in our district, in the northern boonies country of our diocese. Anyhow, it was something that their band would play, you know, as kind of their entrance music when their team would come on. And, and sure enough, in the district tournament in my senior year, we had to go up against them. Unfortunately, they had, they had it their way that night. But it takes me back to Hibbing Memorial Arena when I hear that song. And it gives me chills to, to hear that, that tune. I believe it's called Horizontal Hold by Jack Trombie, if you want to look it up. It's CBS NFL Today um, fame from the early 80s, late 70s. Um, anyhow, it has that power to give us that, that kind of chills in our spine feeling. Um, and certainly, it's got the power also to express our purpose, our values, you know, and here we can look more directly at lyrics. You know, we can, we can hear in the lyrics, you know, particular messages, particular value systems, particular types of, you know, motivations, let's say. Um, but even in instrumental compositions, you know, instruments can express a sense of, you know, kind of that adrenaline rush, as I alluded to earlier in the moving emotions part. Um, but also, it can be disturbing, you know, it has that power if, um, years ago, if you ever heard of Radix, which was the one-man passion play by Doug Berry, and I believe the musician that was with him, I, I think his name was 
Eric Genis or Genis or, um, and they used to do their little one-man passion play and it was Eric who was on the keyboard and he had the ability to draw us in, you know, either to be disturbed or to be vindicated and, you know, joyful just through his tones on that keyboard. Um, and it was part of actually their lesson for that night in addition to their little one-man passion play. So it's got all of these powers. You know, we can think of patriotic songs. We can think of, you know, again, you know, our, yes, music that we use in church. And within our faith perspective, you know, we want to aptly apply here what St. Augustine really did say. And I say it that way because honestly, the, the cliche that the one who sings well prays twice we don't really know if Augustine really said that, but we do know that he said this, that the one who loves sings. And so, you know, we sing as a response to God, to praise him, to petition him. And we're being invited more and more to grow in that response, going deeper with it. And another voice from the not too distant past would be Pope Benedict the 16th, in an essay of his on music that's found within his larger collection of essays that were combined in the book called The Spirit of the Liturgy, you know, he tries to put words to this expressive nature of music in reference to God more specifically by basically relating how singing is done in tension of the past, what God has done, the present, what he is doing, and the future, what he promises, and that we praise God for his works, but we anticipate the ever new and unending song of heaven. And so there is that expressiveness even in that way. And then, you know, we don't want to deny, even though I, I believe, and I say it this way because, again, not being a, a professional musician, I am a little bit sketchy on some of this detail, but. I think most would acknowledge that music as entertainment is a more recent phenomenon in human history and, and not something that really existed, you know, in say even the early church, that music at that time was more strictly a means of worshiping um, and, and accordingly related to, you know, kind of the, the purpose behind it. Um, and, and not so much as something just from which pleasure was meant to be derived, even though, of course, for however long it's been, it's been a huge industry to, you know, produce music for entertainment, for pleasure, etc. And on our part, you know, in acknowledging these powers of music in this way, you know, more generally now, we want to hone that in and focus on music you know, within the context of relationship with God, God himself as creator and therefore source, yes, of music, you know, insofar as he is also the source of the capacity for, you know, sound, sound being, you know, what is caused by what vibrates, if we're going to go into physics here, even though I'm no physicist either, um, but the sound, the the reality to perceive sound through hearing, um, to the fact of being able to make sound, you know, kind of in an order and to communicate through spoken word that is heard through, and yes, through sung speech. You know, th all of these have their source in the very truth that God is. He is the creator. All things came to be through him and without him nothing came to be. And, you know, as with any and every gift from God, its most proper and perfect fulfillment is in none other than in God himself. That our singing in this way is honestly truly meant for worshiping God. Not to say it's wrong to use it for these other purposes, but the highest good of music is when it is utilized in worshiping God. And, you know, it's meant for worship in this way. And so what follows then is that, you know, these other 
types of functions, purposes of music, you know, show that no, entertainment is not the highest good for music. Um, but it truly is, you know, God. And here I just draw us back to concepts from session two. If you remember, and I've, I've referred back to this throughout the series, how God as initiator goes out of himself, the exitus, you know, the sending forth, you know, in terms of creating, in terms of all of his works, he goes out of himself. Why? Because through what he creates, he is more greatly glorified, and that which he creates is able to find its true fulfillment and purpose and sanctification in him. But that only happens when what is sent forth returns to God, the reditus, as it was defined. And so, you know, to make more sense of this, we can once again appeal to the session two models of worship to help us, you know, realize that music is meant as right return for God. But we want to add to this delineation that one of our struggles, you know, in terms of the tensions in which we live in this time, is this question of whether or not it's from God's initiative or our initiative that this happens. And I think a very plain way to kind of peel back the layers on this is a set of phrases that the church even uses in talking about music. How we talk about that we're not meant to sing at worship or specifically sing at mass. We are called to sing the worship. We're called to sing the mass. And I think our two little pictograms here give fit kind of expression to each of these expressions. So if you recall our typical understanding of worship, you'll recall there's no perceived need for any kind of particular ritual in what is often understood as worshiping God. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's our human initiative. Humans decide how to pray and, you know, what is rendered onto God. Why? Because of course we're here in the church and we want to be here with God in heaven and yes, we want to be in heaven. Why? Because we believe that what Jesus did 2,000 years ago is the gate to heaven, that through Christ we are brought to God. But again, starting with our initiative, you know, we want to acknowledge here that there's a subjectivity in this. There's a sense of some questions that get brought out with regards to you know, well, okay, what are we going to do when we pray? How are we going to pray? What's going to be the most effective? What's going to be the best, etc., etc., etc. And so it leads to real and practical questions on the level of such things as deciding when to sing and when not to sing, when the music is utilized. You know, establishing how it's utilized. And by that, I particularly want to mean, you know, is it just going to be a certain select group that do the singing on behalf of the rest? You know, what I've called in my notes, is it given over to specialists to do the music? Or is it meant to be engaged in by all who are partaking in the worship? And then, of course, there's the, the hot button issue of what is sung in terms of the the choices of the selections, what type of music is used, etc. And so within this vision, you know, certainly we want to acknowledge music, yes, is given a very high place. After all, even many of our pre Protestant brothers and sisters, for example, know the expression that the one who sings well prays twice. And they may even know the, the actual Augustine quote, that the one who loves sings. So, you know, in this scenario of a typical understanding of worship rooted in our own human initiative, you know, you have all of these questions, but you also have, yes, a very high place for the reality of music, knowing it has all of these powers to form us, to move our emotions, to express our faith, etc. Um, 
But, you know, real questions also exist in terms of, well, if that's the case, and if there are kind of open-endedness in terms of the what and the how and the who, then we have some struggles in terms of, well, what if it appeals to some but not others? What if it's, frankly, and, and this is a real problem and something I, I point out in the name of the integrity and you know, intellectual honesty of tonight, that in this typical model or understanding of worship, very often music is in the hands of a few and the rest of the congregation goes along with it as opposed to it really being, this is what our congregation will best gain from. Um, and so we have to acknowledge these things. Meanwhile, if we move back over to our Catholic model, where again, it's not about human initiative, but it's about the very fact that the sacraments are what they are, efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us, that the sacraments are God giving himself to us, us partaking of what he has given, and then giving ourselves in return through the act of faith, through the bowing down of worship, through the living of that covenant love, the ex opere operato nature of the sacraments by the very fact that they are carried out, they are completed. Because this is what we have in our Catholic worship as has been handed down through the centuries, you know, a lot of these issues and questions have very clear and simple answers, quite honestly. Because if God is the actor, then, you know, we first, again, as recipients, our call is to partake of that which is made present to us. And when it comes to the ritual then, what is made present to us is not meant as, you know, decision by a committee. It's meant to be in line with what has organically developed in the life and history of the church. In a little while, I will be drawing us back to the other set of terms from session two, lex arandi, lex credendi, the law of prayer is the law of belief, how our worship in the 2000 history, 2000 year history of the church has been a means of organic development as it's sometimes referred to, where you know, it hasn't been legislated per se that the worship will look like this, but rather it is the worship proceeding forth from the very event of Christ crucified, died, raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, etc., and how the early church, you know, celebrated that which the Lord entrusted to them, to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit to confer the Holy Spirit through confirmation as we saw the apostles did in Acts of the Apostles, to, yes, celebrate the breaking of the bread as we see in various places, particularly, again, you know, Luke refers to the Eucharist in that way, the breaking of the bread, but we also have allusion to certainly celebrating the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians and so forth, you know. And from there, the ritual tradition organically developing and eventually being codified by the church. And some of that will be significant tonight, even in the context of music, the, the codification of the music as you know that which is fit and suitable for the worship. So we have this, and in a real way then, you know, we're invited not just to sing at the worship, but history shows us how the worship always has been meant to be sung, and it's to sing the worship. And accordingly, these questions of the, the who, the what, the how, the why, you know, minding that this is an inherent reality then. Music isn't something added on to the worship or something chosen to be integrated at specific parts in the worship, but it's truly meant to flow from the worship you know, the sacraments, for their part, give us that which is meant to be sung. Um, and so, very specifically here, to appeal to the Mass. When we think about the Mass, 
Certainly we have the order of the Mass as it exists today. And within the order of the Mass, you have the what we call ordinary of the Mass or the parts that are part of every Mass or if not every Mass, you know, they are, they are part of the structure that makes the Mass what it is and some things are utilized when they're fit, like the glory to God or the creed, for example, as things that aren't used all the time, but they are part of that order of the Mass where things like the collect, a.k.a. opening prayer, things like the Eucharistic prayer, things like the other orations that the priest says, you know, from the, the Missal. These are things that are part of the, the Mass too, but these are things, you know, the, the orations that the priest says, we know that those change from Mass to Mass. And those are referred to more as the propers of the Mass. And if we had a lot more time, I would go into a lot more detail on this because there's a lot to be said about when to sing which and when to, you know, kind of a hierarchy of singing. If you can only sing some of the Mass, these things should be sung ahead of these other things. And we will get to that a little bit, but not to the depth of detail that I think we could go just because there's so much that we need to tread upon tonight. Um, but realize that what is it that's meant to be sung? It's these very texts. And where do these texts come from? Very, very often, they come directly from the sacred scriptures, or they might be snippets of sacred scripture utilized as just, you know, like the simple antiphons. So, you know, in, in every hand missile and every, you know, risk I call it this, kind of disposable publication that has the monthly readings or daily readings once a month at a time, etc. because I don't want to give free advertising on this one, sorry. Um, but you, in these things, you'll see entrance antiphon, you'll see communion antiphon. These are the very texts that are meant to be sung. These are the very substance, and thus again, we don't have to ask the question, well, what do we want to sing then? Well, it's right there for us. We don't have to ask who is going to sing, because some of the parts are meant for the priest, some of the parts are meant for the people, some of the parts are meant for everyone, priest and people. So that question is answered too, you know. And then the church will even give us an answer on how to sing. And to that we will get into in a little bit here. But you see that what we have going on here is an opportunity for us, yes, to offer this gift of singing and music back to the Lord in a very clear and, yes, structured way without it being subject to, you know, one whim or another if we're willing to have it that way. And that's where the key lies here. And that's where, again, tonight might not be a, a pleasant experience for some who are listening, because these might be things you've never heard before. And some of the sources that I'm soon to get to here are going to kind of roll that out for us in terms of the church's own wisdom on these matters. But let's go back to Augustine for a second, that the, lo the one who loves sings. In this context, again, we want to emphasize exchange of covenant love. God is loving us, giving himself for us. You know, the sacraments in their ex opere operato nature, they're a sharing of heaven in the here and now of earth by which God is inviting us to be drawn to him. So long as we partake of the right disposition, of course, we receive the grace, we receive that divine life drawing us closer to him, and thus we're receiving his love, and indeed, the more we practice our faith, it causes within us, or has that capacity to cause, a want to love him in return. And thus, the one who loves, sings. And in a sense, it causes us to want to sing, or at least I would hope it would, minding, you know, the beauty behind that. Um, and similarly, you know, these 
appeals to the formative power of music, the expressive power of music. You know, it, it provides a means for us to, by singing the Mass, to, yes, be formed more fully in who we are. Because, of course, the texts that are sung are texts that speak the truth of faith. And this is another important element here, that what is sung, there is nothing here that in terms of if we were just at face value to take the antiphons and the given texts of the Mass as they are, all of that is true. All of that is as it really ought to be in terms of articulating our faith and thus forming us in what our faith is, but also then expressing, you know, when we sing the glory to God, you know, we are expressing praise and glory and adoration to God and acknowledging Jesus Christ as the only Son in the unity of the Holy Spirit, giving glory to God the Father, etc. Um, so all of these truths, you know, we want to seize upon and, and we will be coming back to this formative piece again because again it will be important so all of this being the broad overview now we want to get into the meat and potatoes and that's to start talking about some key principles for music and singing the worship um, and i want to start out by just disclosing up front key sources recent sources that are necessary for us to, to look into. You know, both things that are a little bit older, but also things that are very, very recent. So as to please God, give the broadest view of our face value approach to everything that the church has handed on to us. So we will look at a few statements from the Holy See over the last 125 years, beginning with one that remains very significant. And honestly, there were more that could have been chosen from, but to my mind, these are kind of the key ones just because of their timing and the situation in which they were written. So we've got from Pope Pius X, an encyclical called Tra Le Solicitudini on sacred music. And this was written in 1903. And I'll say a little bit about, about context of that as I quote from it. Same is true of an encyclical by Pope Pius XII from 1955, Musice Sacre Disciplina, which again, 1955, we're approaching Vatican II. So we've got a preconciliar voice in a sense. He already, and I quoted this document from him earlier in the series, Mediator Dei from 1947, which is his kind of prime work on, on the liturgy itself as liturgy, where we glean some deeper understanding about the interior nature of participation in worship. So too, he wanted to, you know, give teaching on sacred music in advance of a time where I think it's pretty credible to say that even he realized there was reform coming. Um, and then we have Musicum Sacram, which was not of a pope, but of the Congregation for Sacred Rites, which now carries the title, the Dicastery for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, is how they're known today. Um, so 1967, so now we are post-Vatican II and you have an official statement, an instruction on sacred music, as it was called, um, from the Holy See. And obviously, we want to look at what the council itself said in the overarching document on worship, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, where chapter six, or paragraphs 112 to 121, are specifically devoted to sacred music. And then because we are a U.S. audience here, it's important we hear from our own leaders and bishops in this country, seeing that a big part of, and I'll allude to this also, of, of the Vatican II methodology in writing the Constitution on Sacred Worship included very frequently handing off to local bodies of bishops 
what they called competent territorial ecclesiastical authorities, certain authority to propose and honestly to choose what they believe would be best in their particular setting of the church within their culture. So our own U.S. bishops most recently, even though they had two earlier statements of this nature from the 1970s and the 1980s respectively, in 2007 they issued what is their third kind of comprehensive statement on sacred music called Sing to the Lord. And then finally, we want to look at what's found in the Roman Missal itself, the book from which the Mass is prayed, in its general instruction. Because, of course, just as it tells us, you know, the various details of this, that, and the other thing, every jot and tittle of the worship, quite honestly, of the Mass, so too it weighs in on music. So we want to follow the, the guidelines and principles given there. Um, and principles being only that, you know, we want to do our best to apply these principles um, by exploring, you know, the various elements that the principles imply with regards to theology, with regards to, you know, this organic growth of the liturgy that I've described, how the liturgy, you know, very much in the life of the church developed as opposed to being sat down and cobbled together and then issued forth from the Holy See, or at least that's what it was meant to be, is always kind of an organic growth. That said, you know, we will see, you know, such things as primacy of the word. We will see things like the ministerial function of music. We'll talk about what's truly admissible for use in worship we'll talk about that which is used as accompaniment for singing. And we will also look at a little bit more on, you know, some of the employment of music in the worship. So all of these things under the umbrella of principles, minding that yes, we are to sing the worship, not simply sing at worship. Um, and that in, the intended goal is to be drawn more deeply into union, communion, perfect participation in the life of God, in the covenant love. So to get right at it, primacy of the word. This principle especially applies, minding how music, again, of its own nature, has this power to form us and to be expressive. And as I've mentioned just a few minutes ago, the, the principle lex orandi, lex credendi, the law of prayer is the law of belief. We want to interpret this primacy of word under that umbrella, you know, understanding that the words that are used in the worship then lead to how the faith becomes articulated and accordingly how it's taught and yes, how it's received by us. And of course, this lex orandi, lex credendi doesn't end there. It leads to a lex vivendi, meaning the law of living. So what is prayed leads to what we believe, which leads to how we put that belief into practice. Um, and it's important that we consider this in a very plain way, you know, minding again this formative power, this expressive power of music. Um, and so what I want to first point out is, again, as I did when I was pointing at the model of Catholic worship, you know, the primary formularies for the words of worship come from the scriptures. But also I want to point out that, yes, there are the words of human beings in there, poetic words at times, even though they're pretty rare nowadays. Um, but if you remember, like at Easter or specifically at Pentecost and Corpus Christi, you have these, what's called the sequence. You know, these are poetic hymns written by saints. Um, but you also have these prayers, again, the ones that I referred to earlier as the collect, or then we have the prayer over the offerings, sometimes called the secret, 
and then there's the post-communion prayer. These prayers are very clearly the written works of human beings. Most of the time, popes or bishops, many of whom are canonized saints, and many of these prayers date back to antiquity and were not just written when they decided to put out a new missal. You know, there was nothing of the nature or nothing meant to be of that nature. These are things handed down in our patrimony, minding that these kinds of prayers, you know, for the opening prayer, the collect, for the secret, typically speak to the specific day that we are celebrating, whether it's a feast of, you know, a part of the mystery of our salvation, you know, our Lord's Annunciation, our Lord's Nativity, our Lord's Ascension, that kind of a feast, or it might be something more related to liturgical time, you know, Lent, Easter, you know, the ordinary time as we now call it, um, etc. Or it might even be that which pertains to a saint, as many of those prayers on the saint days are specifically written and they tend to have a tone of, Lord our God, who inspired saint, insert name here, to live, insert particular charism or notable virtue or even perhaps notable uh, kind of legacy in their life, grant we pray that we might follow their example, etc. So these prayers are, you know, not random, but they are, they are very much given to us through, you know, great reflection, great prayer, and thus, you know, handed down over time. And a real point I want to make here is that there's precision in these words. You know, precision, you know, obviously, sacred scripture, say no more. It's the word of God. We need no more precision, even if at times people say, well, the sacred scriptures are contradictory or whatever their argument is. That's for another night. That's apologetics 101, not liturgy 101. But anyhow, um, b bottom line here is that God's word is as given. And yes, while we work out of translations, and there are a multiple set of tr English translations out there, the church in her wisdom discerns this translation is most fit and accurate according to you know, our sense of how to interpret scripture, well, not just scripture, but the foreign language that it's written in, etc., and the time from which it was written, so forth. Um, so we, we have to acknowledge the precision of these things, because if our words were to be imprecise in, you know, the scriptures themselves, or even in these other prayers, this imprecision is going to affect our way of formulating the faith and most likely our way of also teaching and living the faith. Um, and if we're not precise, we subject ourselves then to possible errors, even if it is unintended errors. You know, we throw the word heresy around. Well, there's different le levels of heresy. Sometimes heresy is very much intentional in terms of, you know, someone who's strident about this is what the church really, you know, ought to teach. And they're, they're strident and they declare themselves to be an authority. And, and certainly we don't want any of that. But we can, by no fault of our own, fall into kind of a heretical way of practicing the faith if we're not precise about what the faith really is. Um, and because music has the power to form us, how much more then, if we're singing things that have error in it, are we going to be subjecting ourselves to living what is errant? And I think that's something that invites pause for reflection without going into examples even. I think we can all kind of reflect on our experience of music and worship and ask ourselves, okay, is this really what the church believes or not? when it comes to various selections that are presented to us. Um, and let me say something about the scriptures, because this we have to adamantly, in a sense, I would even use the word enforce, is that because the scriptures 
are given as they are, and because the church has the authority to decide which translation is to be used in our sacred worship, so like here in America, for our English lectionary, the readings, we have the revised New American Bible that the U.S. bishops themselves basically own the copyright to and have overseen its translation and have issued, and they have, within their competency to do such, with the blessing of the Vatican, have said this is the version of English scripture that will be used for the readings. That said, it is essential that we always hold true to that. And while maybe few of us here have experienced chanting of the readings, all of us surely have experienced chanting or singing of the responsorial psalm and the gospel acclamation. And when we take liberties with that and use a substitution that's maybe the same passage from scripture, but not an officially approved text for the, the, the worship, we're already gone astray. These words matter, and it's the bishops who decide that. And likewise, if we go to even a step further and say, well, I really like this setting of this psalm better than the words that are here and how you know our hymnal puts it to music. So let's insert you know, more stylized song where they're all in out paraphrasing the verses, for example. That's even further astray, I would say. And so we have, to, we have to be honest about these things. And then secondly, with this primacy of the word, we want to acknowledge that even in some of the, the songs that are composed, that the reference based on scripture is not always foolproof. You know, you'll see that in the copyright information at the bottom when you look in your hymn book. You'll see all of the music score and at the bottom it's got the little five point size font there with who composed it, when it was composed, and then you'll often see based on, insert scripture citation here, and, and sometimes, you know, what they're doing is certainly noble in an attempt to try to provide good and fit music, yes, based on scripture, but what comes first, the word or the melody? Very often, I would say almost exclusively, it's the melody, right? Because they write their melody and then they have to fit in, well, even though this particular passage has a rhythm to it, especially if they're using like a prophet or say one of the Psalms to base their, their hymn off of or their, their contemporary song, sometimes, well, this, song, this line has too many syllables. I don't have enough notes. And where I have half notes, I don't want to put in two quarter notes because that would be wonky, etc. to try to get all those syllables in. So what do they do? Well, they paraphrase. And what happens? It's the melody coming ahead of the word. And we cannot accept this. And we cannot accept it because, especially with the scriptures, it has its own integrity as God's word. And so we have to be real about these things. Um, and if we need an example that's by no means trivial, even though it isn't musical per se, we all remember in this room, in 2011, 2012, we went through a transition from one translation of the prayers for mass to a new translation. Why did they do that new translation? Among other reasons, the previous edition was translated with an allowance for what they call dynamic equivalence, a, an ability to paraphrase the Latin text to basically you know, be more shall we say, palatable to the ears of a, a native language speaker of whatever language was being translated into. In our case, obviously, English. So they use this dynamic equivalence. And honestly, if you look at some of these prayers side by side, which we can do because we still have the old breviary, the Liturgy of the Hours, which has the old translations of the collects for Mass in them, especially this time of year in Lent, where every day it's a specific collect, 
You know, what you read in your breviary and what is prayed in the Mass very often express two very different things. The old translation very often being more of this primacy on human action. Were the new translation more faithful and literal, even if it's perhaps a little less poetic sounding and a little more clunky sounding, emphasizing God who accomplishes this, grant we pray that from you we would receive, etc. And so that primacy on God is written into these prayers. So that's just another example. Or we all remember, you know, we used to say one in being with the Father. Now we say consubstantial with the Father. It's a more precise term. So this is why they did that. And I think it's a good example as to why we need to be precise with the scriptures. Um, and then a third point would be essentially how sometimes when we give ourselves over to this imprecision with the word, we allow certain words that need not be emphasized to become emphasized. And what do I mean by this? You know, take a melody that has a certain, you know, note or part of, of a phrase within the, the melody or a, a strophe, if I'm using these terms correctly. See, again, I'm not a music expert. But I do know enough to say this part is that, you know, you might have in your melody kind of a rise and a, a forte or, you know, kind of the retardando where you're holding something out a little longer to give it a little more emphasis. And the fact is, is that the word that we want to emphasize? Or perhaps it's something else in that expression that ought to be emphasized. And so, again, these are, these are real issues. And, you know, God bless those who compose music and do it out of good intention. I want to emphasize that also tonight because it's a tough job. I'm glad I don't have it. I'm glad I just get to teach and preach. Um, so... Lex orandi, lex credendi, the words matter, they lead to the articulation of the faith, which then leads to how we live the faith. So then we have the ministerial function, which is very much related to this first point. And Pope Pius X, in his document, Trale Solicitudini, at the very beginning, and, and realize, why is he writing in 1903? Well, believe it or not, even in a church which was doing the quote-unquote old mass where everything was in Latin and nobody could understand anything anyway, there was issues with the music. And what were those issues? Among other things, it was becoming a little bit too given over to the dramatic and to entertainment to the point where people really weren't coming to pray the mass, they were coming to be entertained. And so Pius X had to stand in the breach and issue you know, here's what is to be expected in our sacred music. And here is how we ought to, you know, ensure for the sanctity of the temple, as he refers to it in kind of his opening little preamble to this document. So he says this, he says, sacred music being a complementary part of the solemn liturgy participates in the general scope of the liturgy, which is the glory of God and the sanctification and edification of the faithful. It contributes to the decorum and the splendor of the ecclesiastical ceremonies, and since its principal office is to clothe with suitable melody the liturgical text proposed for the understanding of the faithful, its proper aim is to add greater efficacy to the text in order that through it the faithful may be the more easily moved to devotion and better disposed for the reception of the fruits of grace belonging to the celebration of the holy mysteries. So it is ministering in the sense of trying to make the text more expressive, giving it greater efficacy as the very words here have it, so that people can pray it better and receive that which is meant to be given through it in a more effective way. And thus it's ministering. And even Vatican II backs this up. Paragraph 112 of Sacrosanctum Concilium on the sacred liturgy basically says, the musical tradition of the universal church 
you know, acknowledging its artistic value. It, it goes on to say that its preeminence as, you know, an art greater than any other is that as sacred song united to words, it forms an integral and necessary part of the sacred liturgy. So this sense of, again, ministering to the liturgy, making it more of what it ought to be as a means of drawing us into union, communion with the Lord. So that's just kind of a very brief sense of this ministerial function. And now we can get to types of music. Acknowledging here up front that the church has its own very specific and definitive preference, but it is also very much open to other types of compositions so long as they are fit for the goal and the purpose of the worship. So back to Pius X in 1903, he says things such as that the music, you know, no brainer here, must be holy and not profane. And he gives the gold standard to holiness and not profane and seen as art to Gregorian chant as the supreme model for sacred music, while also acknowledging that such things as what is known as polyphony, you know, which is essentially a form of chant in parts, you know, and particularly mentioning by name Palestrina, who's a pretty prolific name in pro polyphony circles. Um, you know, these are exemplary, but he also says modern compositions, yes, are admissible while cautioning that, you know, by nature, anything that's secular or lean toward what he calls the theatrical style, so again, in his context, in particularly Italy at that time, you know, these things are, quote unquote, diametrically opposed to what is preeminently found in Gregorian chant and in polyphony. So, modern styles, sure, but they need to accord with the end goal and not have theatrical style, be for entertainment, be for a goal other than the worship of God. Fast forwarding then, you know, we can go to Vatican II. Number 116, Gregorian chant is specially suited to the Roman liturgy and therefore has pride of place in liturgical services. It goes on to say other kinds of sacred music, yes, are admissible insofar as they are in keeping with the meaning and the purpose of the liturgical prayer. So wash, rinse, repeat here. Um, please note that in this same document, paragraph 36 says there is to be the preservation of the use of the Latin and that the vernacular, while it is allowable the circumstances in which it will be allowable is to be put under the proper authority of the bishops, both as their collective groups within their nation, the, in our case, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, um, to implement such use of the vernacular. And I point that out because I'm going to come back around to something to do with Latin that is still very much meant to be sung and honestly very accessible for those who don't have to don't want to look too hard for it. it it's it's in most books um, and then 1967 musicum sacrum from the congregation of rites aka dicastery for divine worship um, it seeks again to preserve what has been that Gregorian chant should have pr pride of place, you know, retaining of the Latin, but it is here that we get a little bit more specific appeal to this allowance of the authority of local bishops to discern and judge within their locale those forms of music, that employment of Latin, those forms of new compositions, etc., which will foster devotion that are befitting of the dignity of the liturgy, etc., and therefore are able to be admitted. Minding, too, they go on to talk about how, you know, in missionary territories, 
where they're first hearing the gospel and have a, you know, a sincere patrimony of music for worship that can be judged as fit for Catholic worship, that they want to open that door to discerning that and allow styles that might be familiar to a locale or to a culture. Um, and again, that is very much something that has taken place, I would say, in many areas. And then finally, we get to the general instruction of the Roman Missal, which once again repeats the use of Gregorian chant with openness to other types of music. As for the U.S. Bishop's document, Sing to the Lord from 2007, they once more follow this same drumbeat of Gregorian chant, but they, they go about it a little bit differently because they talk about this expression, all things being equal, which Vatican II uses in prefacing Gregorian chant. And I think it's an important thing for us to consider because if there's anyone out there who is wincing and shuddering, uh-oh, does that mean we got to go back to Gregorian chant by this Sunday? No, that is not at all where this needs to go. Because in fact, many parishes just are not equipped for that. And that is something that the church definitely accounts for, is that we are not all equipped equally. Um, you know, certainly what large parishes with literally thousands of members and, you know, thus the the resources and the means to have choirs from their own members and perhaps even employed staff who are music directors and that. You know, these are the places where, in my mind, these kinds of endeavors need to, to start and to, for that matter, need to be given a second look. But in small rural parishes where you're just trying to get people to commit and you just want to have good and honest people trying to do the right thing and trying to work with them, we're gonna do what we can. And so I think a good summary to all of this is the sense that the church doesn't want to limit possibilities for types of music. Yes, it does want to establish Gregorian chant as having that pride of place, but it also wants to uphold the true nature of the worship as that which is directed as a response toward God, as that which is meant to draw us into more perfect union and communion with him. And thus, anything admitted, musically speaking, for worship needs to be judged in accord with these kinds of principles. So that brings us to the elephant in the room from the last 10 minutes. Why Gregorian chant? Now, in the 20th century, certainly Gregorian chant saw a waning in influence. And, you know, a big part of that, I would say, is simply the, the reform of the Mass itself and the change in the, the ritual expression of the Mass that took place between 1963 when Sacrosanctum Concilium was published and then 1965 when those entrusted with reform of the liturgy got to work, basically. And then 1970, when the first Roman Missal post-Vatican II, or based on the, the principles of Vatican II, was issued. You know, we, we've, see, we've seen this, this change. Um, so why, why is chant, even in a 1967 document, in a 2007 U.S. bishop's document still being given any attention? Well, we have to realize our patrimony here. Chant, honestly, is the church's own music. It grew out of her own praxis. And certainly, you know, there are, and I didn't have time to do a lot of further research. I know of books that, frankly, I want to get myself into, but all in due time. So I can say more, hopefully, in due time about some of the history. Um, but I do know this much, is that you know once Constantine arrives and we have the Edict of Milan and the church is able to freely grow and it's legitimate for Christians to be Christian and they're not you know, judged as second-class citizens any longer, but are equally able to practice their Christianity as much as any other religion could be practiced, 
you have the welling up of, of course, the reality of the monastic life. You know, St. Benedict being here in our Western church, an example of, and the father of Western monasticism as we call him, but even predating him, you've got the monasteries starting to crop up. And in these monasteries, they are praying the Psalms, just as the church had always been doing. They are praying the liturgy of the, the breaking of the bread or the Eucharist or the, you know, the mass, you know, whatever term was fit for them at, or the divine liturgy even as some of our Eastern brothers and sisters refer to their Eucharistic worship. What was their music? It was a, a rendition of plain chant, a chant that again, held the word in primacy, a plain chant that could be easily learned by those who were present and carried out with a sense of meditation, a sense of dignity with it, etc. That we call it Gregorian chant is attributable, and, and I, I found some varied interpretations on this, so I'm going to go what I learned here several years back, is that Gregorian chant is basically named such because of Pope Gregory the Great, who was Pope from 590 to 604. He, for his part, brought together collections of chant. And so it bears his name as the one who was sort of the one who, in a sense, codified it and made it a little bit more officially the church's formal music by bringing together what was in one monastery and another and one locale and another. Um, even though other sources want to say that Gregorian chant really didn't get its start until the, you know, the era of Charlemagne, you know, circa early ninth century and in such places. And there is truth to that as well of, of it becoming more, you know, embellished and, and, and developed and so forth. But certainly Gregory ha had a significant role of bringing together what was. So it's the church's own music developing organically again from within, not something imposed from without. Second, you know, the nature of chant is just that, natural. You know, it reflects the, the cadences and sounds of nature. Chant, by its very definition, is sung speech, where again, as I've emphasized multiple times, there's a primacy on the word, with the melody serving the word. Um, if you remember last week's terms of consonantia, from our discussion of beauty and criteria for what is beautiful, you know, that being ordered, that which containing in itself, you know, kind of a, a sense of right proportion, so too chant in its natural way has that harmony as opposed to, again, kind of speaking more musically, dissonant sounds which are more jarring and more perhaps kind of upsetting. Um, there's a consonance to, to the way of chant that's meant to be there. And of course, the eight neumes or modes of chant that exist kind of traditionally, each have their own pattern. Um, admitting I didn't take good notes in this class because I looked at my notebook today, but I had a teacher, Father Samuel Weber, Benedictine priest, who's still around that I know and doing some continued work to try to promote English plain chant. Um, last I knew he was working in San Francisco in their archdiocese. Um, anyhow, he, he was the one who taught me and he, you know, we went through each of the eight modes and he had all of these kind of poetic sort of waxings on the nature of each mode of chant. And so, and, and certainly as a Benedictine, he would know these things. So, um, by no means are the chant patterns or the modes random. But I think, and this is an example from him and why I bring up his name, because to be corny for a second, to make sure everyone's still awake at that, um, he was the one who said, you know, think of how when children play and the sounds they make. Na 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 na. I forget which mode that is, but that's, that's, right, out of, that's right out of chant. So, 
There, there is this natural quality to it. Um, and even the, the bishop's statement, number 78 of Sing to the Lord, Gregorian chant draws its life from the sacred text it expresses, and you know, recent editions employ you know, a revised notation. So I haven't addressed so-called square notes, because sometimes modern musicians, they see the square notes and want nothing to do with it. If for no other reason, they just haven't been taught. And I, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and so can chant be written with modern notation? Absolutely. Um, and this is something that I think gets overlooked. And so I speak to people who still do chant today, if there's any out there on the, the internet broadcast, that chant is meant to be restful and that it integrates silence within the song. Um, you know, it's couched in silence, quite honestly, and it doesn't require a constant, you know, undertone of melody to accompany it, but rather, you know, it, it can be done with a sense of pausing and breathing. And again, back to Father Samuel Weber, he used to, you know, insist on us because when he, when he taught his one class, that was one thing, but he was also there as sort of our music leader. So when we would pray together every day, he was there coaching us, teaching us how to chant, and he was insistent that with chant, you want to speak the chant, sing the sung speech at a typical cadence with which you would speak. You know, it's not meant to be too slow, but it's also not meant to be too fast and that there's meant to be a restfulness to it, such that when you finish one line, that you breathe, and then you go on to the next line. And so he tried to ingrain these principles in us to the effect that also, and I guess this is the point I really wanna make here, is that we all have our ability. Some are good singers, strong singers, confident singers. Others maybe are a little less confident. Others might claim the proverbial cliche, I can't carry a tune in a bucket, whatever the case is. You know, we have, we have the talents we do. The nature of chant is such that if you're a strong singer, you need to rein it in and help sustain the ones who maybe aren't as strong so that what you have coming forth is one integrated voice and not one or two piercing voices that out last or you know overpower the other underlying voices and this is something that needs to be practiced it doesn't necessarily come naturally especially again with you know much of the modern music where it's well if i'm going to get into it i'm going to sing in the top of my lungs well no let's let's rein it in let's rest here um and if this wasn't already implied it's important to acknowledge that chant is even pre-Christian. Certainly, there would have been primitive chants of God's chosen people, Israel, praying the Psalms. But above all, it upholds intentionally that principle of the primacy of the word, emphasizing not the musical melody or the rhythm, but applying music to the spoken word so that the word can be given a greater dignity you know, according to the specific noom. And the embellishments come as an opportunity to emphasize particular words or phrases within the text, as opposed to, you know, just wherever that written melody in time and in meter happens to emphasize a word or another word. Um, and so it, it, it truly is suited for the liturgy in this way. So then, where do hymns really fit into all of this? You know, hymns are often very, and meant to be, poetic expressions of divine truths, or for that matter, petitions of God, etc. cetera. Um, and, and honestly, our Catholic heritage of hymns is also very real, but less, let's just say, out in the open because of the fact that 
the Liturgy of the Hours as we know it, or what was formerly called the Divine Office, it has hymns. And it's those hymns that are more of our Catholic patrimony of hymns. And, and just, to, just to kind of make a point here about where we are today in reference to these last 75 years, one of the things that's happening right now, even though we priests, whether they're eagerly awaiting it or dreading it because it's going to mean, well, now I've got to learn how to pray the breviary again because it's going to be a different translation once again, um, and deacons too for that matter. It's going to be a different breviary and prayers that we've maybe committed to memory well, now we're going to have to start over again. So perhaps some of the brothers are dreading the new, new Liturgy of the Hours. But one of the things to look forward to in the new Liturgy of the Hours is the restoration of these ancient breviary hymns. Because the current breviary, without naming names, appeals to a lot of post-conciliar musicians whose stuff really never caught on. And even though it was used maybe for a period of a couple decades, I open up that breviary and I say, oh, this is one of hymns or one of his hymns. And I say that in a little bit of a pejorative sense only because we don't have any music score. It's just the text. And when you look at his text, it's like, I can't follow this. So how am I supposed to sing this? So then I end up just reciting it, which honestly in our praying of the breviary is legitimate for us to recite the hymn. But that said, you know, some of these things just didn't catch on. But all of these ancient hymns, they have melodies that are rooted in the chant theory. And so they're going to be much simpler, and they're going to, you know, follow a pattern that's more reminiscent of chant as opposed to kind of more modern melodies and so forth. And so hopefully through that avenue, some of those hymns can maybe then be brought into other sacramental worship, particularly the Mass. We'll see. I guess that's going to depend a lot on the publishers and, and how the bishops go about things with regards to different initiatives on music in the future. But hymns, you know, that's our, more of our Catholic tradition, is that hymns were more of the, for the divine office. So after Vatican II, after the change in the Mass in 1970, when hymns became more accepted and admissible to the Mass, where did we get our hymns from? Very often from our Protestant brethren. And I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm simply acknowledging that's what happened. And therefore a lot of what we have, you know, is not really even our own patrimony. And so we need good Catholic music. I guess that's the point to really be made here. Um, but I want to flash back to, you know, the, the, the very fact that, again, the, the Mass itself provides the text that ought to be sung. And this is, again, where chant is such an emphasized point. But then, you know, we want to continue to promote the admissibility of other kinds of music. And thus, new hymns are welcome, so long as they fit the criteria of being suited to the liturgy, that they have correct theology, that they, you know, truly do enhance people's want to de be devoted to the Lord, etc. What about accompaniment? Here is another one of these sort of wash, rinse, repeats from the 20th century, beginning with Pius X back in 1903 again. He first says, Music proper to the church is purely vocal music. But obviously, that's not always easy to pull off. So, music with accompaniment of the organ is also permitted, is how he puts it. Um, along with other instruments by proper permission. And so long as the organ and other instruments should merely sustain the singing and never oppress it. So we want to talk about primacy of singing in reference to instruments, that the, 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 the sung word is more important than the, the instrumental music. Musice Sacre, 1955, Pius XII, he says, besides the organ, other instruments can be called upon to give great help in attaining the lofty purpose of sacred music, so long as they play nothing profane, nothing clamorous or strident, and nothing at variance 
with the sacred services or the dignity of the place. And to me, this statement here, I think is important to, to not forget. You know, it's, it's long been on my mind, you know, his, his expression, nothing clamorous or strident. I think that that's worth a second thought on some of what has become accepted in many places, you know, because what is clamorous? Well, it's something that honestly is more distracting than it is helping to sustain the, the sung word. And as for strident, I interpret that word in this context to mean something that it's done for its own sake. It's done, you know, kind of to, to make the music something that it's not intended to be in this context as a, a means to offer higher worship to God, to draw us into deeper communion with him. It's, it's more of, we're gonna do it this way kind of a thing. And, and so I think it's worth honest reflection in terms of what kind of instruments get used to, to keep that expression in mind. And obviously nothing profane. Um, and that's a whole can of worms that honestly I don't wanna get into tonight, but there again, one that honest reflection I think bears our heating. Um, Musicum Sacrum, 1967, on instruments. You know, it, it appeals to culture, you know, considering a given place, what instruments are used there, that these things can be perhaps employed. Um, and it gives kind of these criteria, you know, those instruments which are by common opinion and use suitable for secular music only are to be altogether prohibited from every liturgical celebration and from popular devotions. So it does, it does still give a standard there. And then in Sing to the Lord, the bishop's document from 07, they again, like Pius X, 104 years earlier, gives that acknowledgement to the primacy of the human voice and that instruments are meant to be used for supporting the singing. But this document, it also acknowledges the organ, giving possible use to other instruments, quote unquote, according to longstanding local usage, provided they are truly apt for sacred use and, or can be rendered apt. And that's from the Roman Missal that they're quoting on that one, because the Roman Missal has similar things to say in this regard. Um, but then they take it a, a few steps further. They mention instrumental music as standalone music, and they talk about how it can be appropriately used as prelude and postlude music, but they're, they're very upfront in saying we should not be seeking to fill every moment where fit silence can happen. And I think that's another area that needs right notability here. Um, and then comes recorded music. It says recorded music lacks the authenticity provided by a living liturgical assembly gathered for the sacred liturgy while recorded music might be used advantageously outside the liturgy as an aid in the teaching of new music, it should not as a general norm be used within the liturgy. Um, I bring that up if for no other reason, I just wanna assure people here, we're doing what we can. You know, I've been with you the amount of time I've been with you and we're doing what we can. There's a high, higher road ahead of us and please God we will in due time be in position to walk that higher road. But for now, we do what we can. And I'm just gonna leave it there and you know, invite further reflection there if, if you wanna have time for that. Um, but the bottom line in all of this is music is always to be offered in the service of the liturgy and not as an entity onto itself. And therefore the types of music and the instruments are judged first according to the nature of the liturgy not the music itself. And in this way, you know, this is kind of my own summary, not all good music or classical instruments are truly fit for the liturgy. Um, so finally, kind of starting to land the airplane, and I'm gonna kind of rifle through this part because this could be gone into quite deeply 
and certainly I'll entertain questions along here in this last part, the fit employment of music when we get to the question time, but certainly I don't want to get bogged down in it. That, you know, minding that the worship is meant to be sung and that we don't simply sing at the worship, the 1967 document, Musicum Sacrum, you know, they, they laid out certain hierarchy of what should be sung ahead of other things. You know, minding, first priority are the acclamations followed by the other parts that pertain to the people, with some songs being sung by the choir alone, provided that the people are not excluded from those parts that concern them, is kind of an overview statement. They go into, you know, they talk about the, the dialogues between the, the priest and the people, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, being among that kind of high level of what should be sung. And then underneath that tier are the more of the, the ordinary parts of the Mass. And then in the th third tier is more of the, the um, kind of the, the extra hymns and so forth that might be added in, in right order. But here's where I want to get to the Roman Missal, because hopefully this can allay some fears as though we have to suddenly throw everything out and change everything by next week. Um, Minding, though, that everything I say tonight, I think, needs to be heeded and respected as given, because it is what has been handed down to us at its face value. Um, so, in the general instruction of the Roman Missal, pertaining strictly, again, to Mass, it speaks of how, you know, when it comes to the Mass meant to being sung, it makes a distinguish, distinguishing character between some parts of the Mass are standalone parts which are meant to be carried out, whether said or sung, without anything else going on. Things like the glory to God, things like the creed, like the holy, holy, holy. Other things that are sung accompany various ritual acts. Your processional, your offertory, your communion. You know, there's other things happening. Even the Lamb of God is put into this category. And so they, they make this distinguishment there. And from there, they kind of go on to talk about the importance of singing and music. Um, to, first of all, overarchingly, say care should be taken to include singing in Mass, especially those parts that are of, quote-unquote, greater importance, and especially those to be sung by the priest or the deacon or the lector with the people responding, or the pe priest and people together. So that's a little bit like Musicam Sacram. Um, they repeat statements about Gregorian chant having pride of place, but then here's something that I want to just digress slightly on, is that the people should, quote, know how to sing together at least some parts of the ordinary of the Mass in Latin. And it is here that I want to point out specifically something that Paul VI did in 1974. Now, where, where do they get off saying that we should still know how to sing some of the ordinary? Again, the ordinary are the things that happen at every Mass, or at least most of the time when they're prescribed, because sometimes during Lent there's no glorias, for example. Um, Vatican II itself, paragraph 36 of Sacrosanctum Concilium, is basically, they're quoting that, that particular law remaining in force, the use of Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. And then it goes on to talk about the use of the vernacular, um, and then how, you know, the, the local bishop's conference is to have right authority over what is in the vernacular versus what is not. Well, in 74, Paul VI put out this little booklet called Jubilate Dale, which contained within it simple chants that were deemed as kind of the, the common standard that every Catholic throughout the world should know. And he wanted this disseminated freely and widely, um, risking to say, I wonder how many people have, even here have heard of Jubilate Dale, um, as whether or not it was distributed freely and widely. Um, but what was in this book, they were chants that I bet if I started singing a few words of some of them, you would know them. Kyrie eleison, 
Christe eleison, which by the way is Greek and not Latin, but that being what that is. Then we've got Gloria in excelsis Deo, et in terra pax omnibus bone voluntatis, etc. And I just thought of something else about chant. Right there, I was kind of high, because the next word, laudamus, I would have had to go way up here. Um, <laughs> chant, one of the beautiful things is that the priest can pick a pitch and you go with it, whether he's a tenor or a, a bass. And that's, that's kind of the nature of the flexibility of chant that it has too. And then we have Credo 3. Credo in unum Deum. And then the more familiar, because they follow the same melody as what we do in English in the so-called ISIL chants. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Sabaoth. Er Onus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Paul VI was saying, every one of us should know these chants. There's still time. It's not too late. We can do this. Are we going to start this Sunday? Probably not. But I'm just saying and putting this out there, this is what Holy Mother Church has handed on for us. Um, so to get back to the general instruction of the Roman Missal, um, I want to especially emphasize two areas, what, what they, the Missal calls the entrance chant and the communion chant, respectively, because they give an order of preference as to what ought to be sung at that point. And that order of preference is important because honestly, it will help us rest at ease a little bit with some of our common practice. But here again, I want to invite us to maybe do a little bit of reflection and asking, could we do what is more preferred? Because they list these preferences in order of preference. So the first thing they say for both of these moments is that what is to be sung at the entrance, AKA opening, or at communion time, is the antiphon from the Roman Missal or the psalm from the what's called Roman Gradual as set to music there or in another music setting. So that little versicle, entrance antiphon, which if you were at the daily mass tonight or risk I say at a daily mass in most parishes, usually some parishes might do it this way where the priest is walking to the altar and everybody is reciting it together. It's been my experience more, especially in a church like ours, where I have to walk all the way from the back to get to the altar, as opposed to being able to come out a side door from the sacristy, like many of the churches are built, where the sacristy is literally a doorway off of the side of the altar, um, to just recite it when I get to the altar. But it could be done where everybody is reciting that little versicle together. Um, well, in the case of music, that is the highest kind of priority of what ought to be sung. And it can be done quite nicely. I don't have my, my publication here, so I can't even remember what today's is. But you can just apply a simple chant melody to it. Um, and I'm trying to just think of one off the top of my head. Um, the one from Doctors of the Church is coming to mind because it gets used a lot when we celebrate Doctors of the Church, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, um, any, anyway, sorry, I'm not equipped to give you an example. Um, but you just apply a simple chant melody and it, it, it can be quite nice. And in, in, in the middle of it, you put a glory be to the Father. So you sing the antiphon, then you sing glory be to the Father to the same melody, and then you repeat the antiphon. That's all you need. Or if the priest is accompanied by concelebrating priests and it's going to take a while for us all to get in there, you might add a verse of a psalm or two and repeat the antiphon as like a responsorial psalm kind of effect. Um, or if he's going to do incense, etc. Um, so that's the highest. The second is what they call a seasonal antiphon. So we're in Lent, 
and there are certain antiphons that can be applied every day. And this is, I think, especially important for, again, small parishes with limited resources. If you wanted to do the same entrance antiphon every day for a whole week, you could do that um, insofar as you're operating in accord with the capacity you have. And then thirdly, it calls it a song from another collection of psalms and antiphons approved by the bishops. This one's a little bit more nebulous to me because if I'm reading that correctly, and I know these exist, is that there are songs written based off of the antiphons at times that are published. And perhaps that's what they're referring to, but, and, and it's the approved by the bishops part that kind of has me stuck. Because otherwise I would say, well, that's just going to your, your graduale or whatever your book is that has these uh, compositions in it. But then fourthly, and here is where I would say probably somewhere in the high 90 percentile most parishes are in this country, a suitable liturgical song or hymn similarly approved by the bishops. So is doing a hymn at the beginning of Mass and at communion wrong? No. But is it the highest road? It is not. And I think that needs to be acknowledged. Um, then it goes on to speak particularly of the responsorial psalm and the gospel acclamation. And again, I said quite a bit about that at the beginning, that you know, it's important that we use the text as given. They speak of choirs in the general instruction and say they have a proper function, including the fostering of the active participation of the faithful through singing. And then a last point I would make here is that there is nothing ever said about a closing hymn, which is interesting because I, I would say, you know, depending on your experience, it might seem like a closing hymn is, you know, something enshrined and that if you don't do it, it's like, what happened? How come we didn't do a closing hymn? But there are places where they can willingly choose, certainly not during Lent, because in Lent, this is kind of a forbidden thing in the name of toning it down during Lent, but there are places where sh it probably happens this way. The deacon says, go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. And then the organist breaks out in a Bach prelude or fugue and off the priest and the ministers go and the organist just plays and that's how it ends. And that too is legitimate. Um, so closing him that we have it, there's nothing wrong with it, but realize at that point it's a little bit more outside of mass. And this is why even, you know, guys like me are a little more lenient with closing hymns, especially when it comes to, you know, doing something that's maybe not religious per se, but patriotic on or around the time of Memorial Day or the 4th of July, you know, that addresses God, but prays or acknowledges the good of our nation, let's say. You know, that's, that's become accepted. Um, and thus there is a little bit of lenience there. Um, so to finally land all of this, and I'm sorry I didn't warn you, I knew tonight was going to be a lot, but I didn't want to cut too much out of it. Um, I just want to, once again, go back to Pope Benedict XVI in his apostolic exhortation on the Eucharist that was given after the Synod on the Eucharist, which actually St. John Paul II called for, but then his death came, so the Synod on the Eucharist actually took place after John Paul II and in the early years of Benedict's pontificate. In his exhortation, Sacramentum Caritatis, he says, in the Ars Celebrandi, which is basically a way of saying in the manner or the art of celebrating the worship, song has preeminent place. Certainly as far as the liturgy is concerned, we cannot say that one song is as good as another. Generic improvisation or introduction of musical genres which fail to respect the meaning of the liturgy should be avoided. Finally, while respecting various styles and different highly praiseworthy traditions, 
I desire, Benedict in this case, in accordance with the request advanced by the Synod Fathers, that Gregorian chant be suitably esteemed and employed as the chant proper to the Roman liturgy. So there again, we're getting in more recent times, year 2007, the church emphasizing this. So as a way forward, might I simply propose, you know, that we want to, yes, acknowledge this primacy of chant as the church's own music, as that which is specially suited, and yes, and I didn't really say this, but calling it Gregorian chant by definition means Latin. Well, derived from Gregorian chant are plenty of means of plain chant, which can be done in any language. And so we'd be talking more about plain chant in English. Um, you know, as Benedict concludes here, that it comprises an organic proportion, or I guess these are my points, it, it is organic to the, the patrimony of the church. And yes, the church remains open to new compositions, so long as they are suitable to the purpose of the worship as an exchange of covenant love offered as fit return to God with correct and precise content that reflects our, our true faith. But Rome wasn't built in a day. And so next week, well, and actually not next week, in two weeks, because next week I had a prior commitment. So next Tuesday we are not here. But in two weeks from tonight, we will wrap up all of this with a session that I've somewhat rhetorically entitled Going Forward or Backwards, you know, in the name of kind of recapitulating everything we've gone through and then what are the next steps really to go forward? What are we called to? How are we called to, yes, live God's will and to prayerly, prayerfully open ourselves more and more? And tonight, minding that we've heard a lot and maybe a lot of things that we didn't want to hear with regards to music, we need to be patient. We need to be truly kind of walking, you know, taking the next step as it comes to borrow from our bishop's way of kind of acknowledging things that, you know, the Holy Spirit only gives us the next step, he likes to say. So, you know, we need to be true to a sense of, yeah, we, we go about this in a patient way, in a way that truly is going to be for the benefit of all and not just the benefit of one or another who say this is better than that. And so, please, you know, keep praying that we would all do God's will. But before we do a closing prayer, I want to make sure you all have your chance to express thoughts, questions, etc. Yes. Why? Well, because that's a link to history, to patrimony, because of course the New Testament, almost all of it, was written in Greek, so certainly the early church was using Greek. And so the Curie Eleison as a, you know, basic kind of saying, Lord have mercy, as it's translated for us, certainly has ancient roots. And so it, it, it was organically a manner of hanging on to, you know, that which came earlier. Where did dynamic equivalence come from? I don't know that I can answer that, but I do know that through the, the last, well now we're going on 60 years since Vatican II, there were several statements put out by the Holy See with regards to implementing Sacrosanctum Concilium paragraph 36 regarding the use of the vernacular. And there was a document if I'm quoting the name right, because I haven't looked at it for a long time, but there was a document early on that actually had a French title. I think it's called Comme les Prévois, if I'm remembering correctly, that basically allowed in the transition for translations to be done in more of this dynamic equivalence, kind of paraphrasical manner, minding that it was meant to be a transitionary 
translation. You know, so I think best laid plans, okay, we have, we have the, the new order of the mass being issued in 1970. So we're gonna need a vernacular version of that right away. But hopefully by, oh, I don't know, 1985, we'll have the horses pointed in the right direction to do a more specific and more permanent translation. Well, let's just say, certainly there were some adaptations and changes early on, you know, because I even remember as a little boy when the priest would say, it will be shed for you and for all men so that sins may be forgiven. And when they dropped the all men, or the men from that words of consecration, you know, somewhere in the early 80s. Um, you know, so there were incremental things like that, but we had to honestly wait all the way to 2011 to get the quote unquote more permanent translation. Realize too that translations by their nature are never permanent. It's one of the reasons why Latin matters. Latin is a dead language. The words in Latin are never gonna change. The words in English are constantly changing. Uh, I woke up this morning. <laughs> that means what it still means, yes, but the word woke also means something else now. <laughs> Words are changing. So none, no translation is ever going to be permanent. Whereas a number of the things we've done over the long term recently are very, we're very time constrained. Yeah, and, and that's, that, that's another element of, you know, again, even my example of the hymns in the breviary, you know, the composer who shall remain nameless, who has a lot of hymns in the, the current breviary, you know, risk I say, his stuff just did not catch on. Well, do I think the future has Gregorian chant in it for the masses? Let's put it this way. I believe what the future does hold is more of a chant-based approach to music. And it's not just because I'm biased, but it's because another element of chant, there's lots of things I could have said and they just keep coming to mind. Another element of chant is the meditative aspect of it. It doesn't project an emotion. So much of the new music projects a particular kind of emotion that maybe I'm not ready for that this morning because I'm sad that a bishop who used to be a brother priest in this diocese just died, for example. Maybe I'm not ready for that. Where chant has more of an even keel to it. And I think as we get more hinged again in it's all about him and it's not about us, that these kinds of things are gonna make a return. Whether it's full-fledged Gregorian chant is another story. But I think there will always be a place for Gregorian chant, if for no other reason, just by God's providence, because it's been with us for a significant portion of our church's history and it's not easily abandoned even if it has fallen into disuse over this period of decades we're living in right now.
Well, tonight I think it's especially important to pray. Because like I say, this, this is to go all the way back to two hours ago, and I knew tonight was going to be long, and I honestly, I don't want to apologize for that. If for no other reason, I wanted to give you as much as I could possibly give you tonight in the name of the integrity and the delicacy of this subject for many people. Um, but I think it's important we pray that again, we're all called to, to one end, and that's eternal life in union and communion with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We already have it through our baptism. We're practicing our faith by living that covenant relationship day in and day out, or at least I hope we are. And certainly our worship of the Mass is the high ex highest expression of that covenant love that we have in this life until it's brought to its perfection in heaven. So we want this to be truly constructive tonight and a cause not for, you know, more division or, or further kind of wedges, but rather perhaps prayerful, to use Francis's word, accompaniment. How do we lead people, all of us, in the same direction? Even people who are way on the other side and say, the church should have never gotten rid of Gregorian chant and every mass that doesn't have it is a bad mass. They need to go on. That's not how it is. So we need to all kind of focus ourselves on what really matters here, if I can be so bold to say that. And so let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this night. Please help us live your will. Please help us surrender ourselves to you, minding that you are the one who gave us all of these beautiful capacities in the human nature to love, to sing, to give ourselves to you in return for what you have given us. So may we totally cooperate with that grace. May the Blessed Mother Mary, the exemplar of such cooperation, intercede on our behalf. May Saint Cecilia, who by her own witness of faith was able to remain true to the, the call that she herself received from you to, to be a chaste virgin and truly to bring others to conversion. May she help us as well to always be true to who you call us each to be, minding that end goal. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.